I uh, knew a, a man named Mike who was a mountain climbing guide at Rainier National Park. He would take people up and down uh, climbing up Mount Rainier. And several years ago, several years ago he, he was wanting me to go up with him. He kept on bugging me. He said, why don't you go up the mountain? I'll take you up the mountain. So my brother Reed and I, some of you know Reed. He's a parishioner here. So Reed and I said, okay, we'll, we'll go up the mountain. Mike, we'll, we'll let Mike take us up the mountain. So the, way, the usual practice here is that you start, it's a two-day thing. You start down at Paradise, and then the first day you get all the way up to 10,000 feet to Camp Muir, where you spend the night, and then really early the next morning you get up, you summit up to 14,000 feet, and then all the way down to Paradise, all in that second day. So I forget why, but our expedition got off to a late start. And so we didn't get up to, I was carrying this 50 pound pack, felt like 100. And we didn't get up to Camp Mirror until about 8 p.m. And we needed to get up at 2 to 3 a.m. in order to begin the ascent to the summit. I was dead tired, tired, tired than I thought. I think Reed actually did better than I was. He would seem to be in pretty good shape. I, I was really hurting. And so collapsed into this little stone hut at Camp Muir. There's no actual window panes. It keeps the snow off you, but there's no door or windows, really. So it's just as cold inside as outside. But I didn't care because I was exhausted, and I just wanted to go into my sleeping bag. So I did. I just crawled into my sleeping bag. I just wanted to go to sleep. But Mike, the guide, told me, no, don't sleep. First, you have to eat. You have to eat a lot. And he had instructed us, bring along in your pack your favorite foods. And so I did. I, uh, I'd taken some fried chicken, some cold pepperoni pizza, some candy, and some trail mix. So, you know, that's the stuff I could usually just, uh, no problem. I, that, I'm always hungry for that. Only now I had no appetite. Uh, I had nothing. You know, you'd think I'd be famished, but it wasn't that way at all. At a certain point, exhaustion suppresses the appetite, kind of like heat. You don't want to get really hot. It's like 95 degrees out. You just don't want to eat as much. So when it, at a certain point, you get tired and you want to eat more. But then you go past that and you don't want to eat at all. That was me. But I knew intellectually I needed to eat. And Mike was on me. He said, you know, again, if I was going to have that long climb the next day, I had to eat. So at Mike's urging and really forcing me, I put down as much as I could of my piece of chicken. Now, I mentioned that experience of, of hunger or lack of, lack of hunger because it, it says something about what's going on in the, God, in the scriptures today. There's a theme here. And that's one of the great analogies historically about life is that it's a journey, right? Life is a journey. And it's a theme in one of our scriptures here. Our, journey, our lives are often journeys that are uphill. At least it seems like that. It seems like it's always hard. I just struggle a lot. You know, that kind of idea that it seems like I'm having to climb this mountain. And we need food for the journey. Food that we may not want to eat. So uh, I think this reflects the, the story in our first reading from First Kings, where we have the story of Elijah. And the prophet Elijah is, in the context here, if you've forgotten, the story is that Elijah is on the run from the evil Queen Jezebel because he has just engaged her pro pagan pr uh, priests in this prayer duel. And Elijah won, and now she's after him. So he's on the run, and she wants to kill him, and he's just tired of the whole fight. And so... He sits under this broom tree. The shade is hot. He's under the shade, and he waits death. He says, Lord, come and take me. Uh, I'm ready to die. But an angel of the Lord appears to Elijah, wakes him up, says, here's some food you have to eat. So he does, but then he goes back to sleep. Second time, the angel comes and says, eat, eat some more, else the journey will be too long for you. If you don't eat, you're not going to make the journey. So Elijah does... And he goes on, and he climbs Mount Horeb, where he has this encounter, this a new encounter with God. He gets up the mountain. So 
Not only do our lives sometimes feel like they're going uphill, but oftentimes it can feel like we're on the run from the forces of evil that seem to be pursuing us. We may have defeated them sometimes. Again, Elijah defeated the pagan prophets, but now he's, it didn't end the thing. Now Jezebel's on his, on his trail. And so we seem to get through one thing, and then suddenly something else happens, and, and, and the evil's all after us. And so I was thinking about that. Uh, we can get depressed and want to give up. So God's given us food for our journey. Just as our bodies need the physical nourishment to get up a mountain. So what if, what's the soul food? The soul needs food. What is it? Again, from our gospel. I myself, Jesus says, am the living bread come down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he shall live forever. The bread I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. So again, context. Remember, we're on this five-week journey through John 6 for our gospel. And this is all the bread of life discourse. And in the Eucharist, Jesus is saying he gives us his flesh and blood to eat as our bread of life. And what is the human reaction to this incredible news? Well, in the gospel, Jesus' listeners start to murmur. This is strange. I don't believe it. It's really kind of disgusting. Flesh and blood, he wants to eat it. What's going on here? It's hard to believe. It's not attractive at that point. So we too, we're sometimes not attracted to that reality. We're not hungry for Christ. And I think of myself at Camp Muir. I was too tired, my appetite was suppressed, the food in my pack was objectively good if you like chicken, pizza, and candy, so, and I did. So I thought, this is good food, but I didn't want it. Again, I, I needed it, but I didn't want it. So the, the Eucharist, this bread of life, the body and blood of Christ, is objectively good. It's the best thing possible. It is the body and blood of Christ, his flesh, as he tells us today. It's available to me and you, and therefore, don't cut yourself off from the Eucharist. This is their one theme today I want to say is, don't deny yourself the Eucharist. Eat. Now, we cut ourselves off from, we suppress our appetite, cut off ourselves from the Eucharist. On the one hand, okay, sin, that separates us from God. And if that's the case, then we need to reconcile. But... That may, sin may not be our biggest problem here. There's also simple disinclination. I don't have the appetite. It doesn't sound good. So if we believe God's available as our food for life's journey, why would we not want to eat as often as possible? Because we have, the answer is, we have little or no appetite for Christ. Even as we know intellectually that we need this food. Remember two weeks ago? I was preaching on this, John 6. I was preaching about coming to Mass every week, not just sometimes. So why do we not always come? Well, it's this reason. We skip. Maybe it's we, the deepest reason. We have all these other surface reasons, but deep down it might be simply be that I just don't have that much appetite for Christ. Our lives can be spiritually exhausting. The day-to-day -day struggle can suppress our appetite for spiritual things. We may be starving for God and yet not feel the hunger. Like, I, again, in that, that cabin, that, that camp, you're, I there's a desperate need of energy, but I just didn't want to have it. We, I would simply say, we sin, we skip mass, we just don't care if we're fed. This is the reason, one of them, why I'm always asking you, please, take 20 minutes at least a day, quiet, solitary time with Jesus. And one of the reasons here is because this is a chance to refresh and rest so that our appetite can grow. If we're spiritually exhausted, run out, drawn out, empty, the answer is, ah, I need to rest so that I, that ex spiritual exhaustion is replaced by this gift of grace that God can give me in prayer. Even if I don't feel like something's happening, taking that time away, it increases my appetite for Christ. In the Eucharist and reading scripture, just everywhere. So, Mike was a good guy. He was a pro. He'd been up, I don't know how many times he was up the mountain or not. You know, a hundred, I don't know. 
But he knew what was going to happen. He knew this rookie was going to not want to eat. He was going to be flabby and old and out of shape. He was going to be exhausted. You better give him some chicken and pizza because he's going to whine. He said, no, eat. So he did the right thing, right? Um, he told me I would need food for the journey to keep up my strength. I had to eat even if I didn't have the appetite for it. And just before, the other, the other um, masses, I, I give us homily, they always want to know. Okay, P.S. I didn't get to the summit. Why? It wasn't my fault. A snowstorm came in that night, and they said, you can't go up, you have to go back down. Okay, that's just concluding the story. But now, let me go on. So as your pastor, think of me as a guide, a mountain guide for your life, trying to get you up the mountain, help you get the up. I can't get you up the mountain, but I can help, and I can give you some advice. And that is, come to Mass, attend to prayer, avoid sin, eat. I mean, not just because, just because you're not excited about the Eucharist at this particular moment or phase, it's not evidence that Jesus is not there. Maybe it's simply that you're spiritually not there and ready. He's objectively good. What's our spiritual subjective state? So get up and eat every Sunday. We need the bread of life. We need the strength of that bread, else the journey is going to be too long for us.